the first part of my presentation about valuation is essential. It's the first step. But now we're going to we're going to talk about the process of actually transitioning the business. And there are variations on this. You could be transitioning it to your children, to your employees, but there are nine steps that every deal goes through. And some of the important things I'm going to talk about aren't on this list, but part of one of the steps. And anything you leave out could be a problem. And your handout is is more comprehensive than my slides. It includes a lot of details that I'm not even gonna mention because they're special cases, but you might be, wanna be aware of them. So the first step is the seller is gonna choose to sell his business. And you'd be surprised how many times that step doesn't happen in earnest. You have to commit to this, to do it right, this is the way what you want for your life and your business and how you want it to come down. And by the way, if you really want the slides, ask her. She has them and I'll, I'll send them to you. And they're also going to be on Anchor's website. Um, so if you want to make them down here, we can put them on. Um, and then it's okay. <laughs> she, she's actually filming this twice. Yesterday didn't come out too well because the makeup man didn't show up and, I, and now the hair, the hair guy didn't show up today. I mean, I, I don't know what's going on. So you make a conscious decision to do this right. And there are a lot of businesses that aren't for sale that appear to be for sale. I'll get into that when we get to seller's warranties. You package the business. I'm gonna give you some steps to prepare your business some of which will definitely apply to you. And you market the business. Now, she can't find you a buyer and neither can I. That's not part of our service. But I'm gonna tell you how you can find a buyer because you're actually in the best position to find the buyer for your business. Once you find a buyer, they're gonna do an initial evaluation. You're gonna provide them with just enough information to do that evaluation and nothing more because you don't want to create a competitor or to disseminate information that can be harmful. The buyer will submit a conditional offer. The people here that are buyers, they need to know this, and you sellers need to be prepared for it because that's the right way to do it. Nobody should come up to you and say, okay, I'll buy it for this, and you shake hands and you go to a lawyer. Uh, the, the buyer should be protecting himself and you should be protecting yourself during the offer and acceptance process. No deal is legal without an offer and an acceptance. So remember that if you get an offer, be careful what you say. So it doesn't constitute an acceptance until you do indeed accept it. Then you do negotiation. You sellers do that before you accept the deal. And I'm gonna teach you how to negotiate. If you've ever flown an airplane 10 years ago, uh, in the centerfold of American Way magazine, every other flight magazine, was an ad, a two-page ad, very expensive ad, for the negotiation seminar by this guy called Karras. And you'd go to a city, he did it all over the country, and you'd spend a weekend in the city, and for $2,000, you'd learn negotiation skills. I'm going to give you everything he gave them for the 10 bucks you spent getting there. And it'll only take about 30 seconds because it's more simple than, than they make it. Due diligence, I briefly mentioned that, how that process works. That's when the buyer gets full access to your business with some exceptions. And I'll talk about what you need to think about, what you're gonna allow before you get a buyer so that you're prepared for this. Due diligence may uncover things that call for a final negotiation. Then you get you get a lawyer who's skilled at execute at writing a purchase and sale agreement to do that document, which will follow much of the same points as the conditional offer letter. Uh, if your lawyer is a great guy and a country lawyer, ask him if he's ever done a PNS agreement. If he says no, he'll he'll be able to refer you to somebody that does. It's a it's a specialty. 
And then the all important transition, which could be a good thing for you, and I'll explain why. So you need a reality check starting with valuation. You need an outsider's viewpoint, looking at that business, not as you as the operator look at it, but as somebody who walks in and considers buying it. And there's, there's a whole resource for you, the SBDC office, they can do this for you. They, they have no stake other than to assist you. And if they see something that is questionable, if they, want, if, if they say, I don't understand this, it's a lot cheaper than hiring a mystery shopper. You need to understand this process. You need to understand that there are gonna be fees involved. And the seller pays any, any fees for things like advertising, cleaning up, um, appraisals that before the, before the deal, um, lawyers to do the purchase and sale. You pay that out of your pocket, not out of the business because it's not fair to the buyer to deplete the assets of the business to sell the business. You are selling it, not the business. Everybody needs to understand due diligence. It's really important. And I've seen it skipped, I've seen it shortcutted, and I've seen disasters ensue. And she can refer you to professionals. She has a referral list, right? Um, and especially in environmental compliance, uh, if there's an environmental issue and you're, you're trying to sell a place that has an environmental issue, you're gonna probably end up having to pay for a phase one if you haven't already. If you have a loan, you probably had to. Um, every case is unique and we can help you evaluate what, what you should do. You don't wanna get into a, a huge expense here. You, you've managed not to do it for years. Let's, let's try and minimize it now. It depends on the deal. Uh, when I sold my medical center, we shared the cost because they wanted it and I didn't care. So they initiated it, uh, things snowballed into, go figure the engineer wanted more money halfway through the deal. And uh, they came to me and said, will you kick in something? I said, all right, you know, uh, because it would have been my problem if I kept the property and, uh, they were doing it for the for the bank, and there was a dry cleaner on the property. And the phase one said you should do a phase two and drill some holes into the groundwater and test it. So they did, and we were clean, but they had to still had to do all of that work and drill through the bedrock surrounding my property. And they had to call in for special equipment that could get through that tough New England granite. So. The initial consideration for the seller, are you really willing, ready to sell and why? And there, you know, a disaster is about to happen in my business, I wanna get out of the way, that's not a good reason, that's, that's not, probably <coughs> not gonna work. You have to prepare the business for sale and I'll tell you how to do that and prepare a data package, a sell sheet, you have to decide how you're going to reach out because you're not, never gonna be able to sell anything if it's a secret. So somebody's gotta know, and I know you may not want your customers or your employees to know, we have to work around that. And the buyer needs to know if you're really serious about selling the business early on. And I say to buyers, if you're not sure, ask her or her, her colleagues to make the call. They can do it and identify themselves as SBDC, I understand your business is for sale, is, is it? You haven't, you haven't come out of the closet, you haven't scared the buyer, the seller, you're just corroborating it. And they're, they're gonna give her an on, they, why wouldn't they answer, honestly? What are you buying? What is, you don't, you're not just buying a business, what are the components that you think go with it? If you just offer to buy the business and say it's a restaurant, there's, no reason why the, the seller can't take the toasters home and uh, other equipment, whatever he wants. You didn't, you didn't include that. So we're gonna talk about how you do that. The buyer should 
here's the neat thing about the, another neat thing about this um, program. Not only will they keep you from going to jail, but you can send the seller to the same office. He'll get a different counselor. They, they want the deal to go through. They really aren't representing buyer or seller. They're representing the business. They're about economic development. So they can assess the seller, the buyer, as far as their capability to run it. They could, they could tell them honestly what they need to do to come up to the bar to, to be able to do that. You'll get limited, the buyer will get limited data at first. The seller, I'm telling you, you have to give them limited data and I'll tell you the limitations. They can help the buyer interpret it. If the buyer says, no, I wanna see all this, it's too soon. And they can, they can explain to the buyer what they've got. Um, they can explain to the buyer how to value it from their point of view. And both of you need to talk about what the process is, how it's gonna unfold. So we talked about the, the basis for valuation, the need to, to not try and double count assets. Uh, there's a lot of emotional involvement in, in all, the, all the situations she looks at because she's dealing with human beings, not with objects. The business has a lot of objects, but the human beings are what goes into her, her office. And these guys are very skilled at dealing with that because they see it all the time. And in a lot of places, especially in negotiation, we need to get past that. Um, it is said that this is a very contentious time we're living in. I disagree because I went to college in the 60s when young people in National Guard uniforms were shooting young people uh, protesting the war, where black people wanted uh, equality and integration and they were being hung for it. That was, that was contentious. This is nothing. What it makes it appear contentious is that at any time, when somebody gets mad, they can pick this up and immediately send, hurl back an insult, and the next person can pick it up and say, oh, yeah? In my college days, you had to make a long-distance phone call or write a letter, and that slowed me down enough, so I counted to 10. I said, that's ah, not worth the fight. So um, don't let the emotion run away. If you're gonna, If you're going to get mad at the other party, go tell her. And she'll tell you, you know, she'll evaluate the, the reality behind the emotion. Yeah. Yeah. I think we have a decent president if they'd only take his phone away at cocktail hours so he can't Twitter all night. But that's just my opinion. Um, the seller may need leads to a buyer, but we, we can't. We can't do that for you. We don't know the market as well as you do. And I'll tell you where to find buyers. Uh, you need help preparing, and I'll give you the steps to preparing, things to think about. You may need marketing help. These guys are great on marketing plans. You may need to formalize a business plan. The buyer may need a business plan. If he's gonna get a bank loan, he, he probably will. That's their specialty. And I get, uh, this is kind of come up again and again. As a, a business owner, you have to have the mindset that you're gonna step out of that business. How is that business gonna run without you? I'll tell you some of the things you can do to assist that, but it also is, is mostly between your ears. What do you want? It's always about your choice. And sometimes there are choices you're not aware of that we'll make you aware of, like that guy I met that wanted out so bad he was ready to blow the place up. and I showed him that there was, he, could make, he, he could do that, but make money at the same time with his same plan. Uh, so uh, preparing yourself as well as the business, you're, you're, gonna, you're gonna separate for something that's very much a part of you. So where do you look for buyers? The stakeholders. Employers, suppliers, customers, contractors, competitors. That competitor that you've always tried to defeat can now be an ally. Uh, you have something they might want. Um, there's a trade association for every trade. There's even a trade association of trade association executives. 
if you're not a member and you're thinking of selling your business, that could be a great resource. You can network yourself into that. You go to a social event, you talk to the organizer and say, who would I talk to if I'm interested in selling the business? Do you know anybody's rolling up similar businesses? And with fairly, fairly confidential, fair confidentiality, you can approach people and talk to them. Now, you know, the world doesn't know, just a few select people, but those are, those are prime buyers, those are your target market. So think about how you would meet people in the same business. And on that topic, Ben here from the New Center for Business Transition, that means part of the service available is a database of uh, businesses that are potential to sell into different confidentiality levels. I don't want anybody to know, uh, but let's start talking about it. Um, Semi-anonymous, like a restaurant somewhere in the Adirondacks available, minimal financial data, and then completely um, you know, listed on the market for all to see. But they're also building a database of people that are potentially looking to buy businesses that are interested in buying businesses in the Adirondacks. So, for example, we got a call from an investor from Saudi Arabia, who's a kid that's going to school somewhere in the North Country, who's interested, um, you know, in investing in a business in the North Country. I mean, it's pretty interesting where some of the leads are coming from. So they're building a database of both potential buyers and uh, businesses for sale, and they're going to try and see if they can. Um, you know, introduce people to one another to facilitate some of those transactions. So, but we'll hear more about that later. Sorry, Peter. Well, <laughs> that's okay. I think that's a great resource. People have come to me many times and I've said, well, can, do you have employees that can buy the business? And the answer, the knee-jerk reaction is, oh, no, they can't run the business. And I have to take off my shoes to count the number of deals where the employee ended up with, with the business. And you can help. No, they can't run the business now because they only see one part of the elephant. They feel the leg and they think it's a tree. They are probably great at the production. When I owned restaurants, I had employees that, that cooked the food, served the food, cleaned up after the customers, swept the floor, did the dishes, on and on. That's all production. And they would come to me and say, I'm, run, I'm doing everything, all the work around here. I'm going to open my own restaurant. So... I could count to 10 weeks and they'd be back. Only their savings would be gone. The reason why is they didn't have the three-legged stool. And the banks know what the three-legged stool is because they won't lend to an entrepreneur unless he has the three-legged stool. There are three skill sets of, of an entrepreneur that are essential. The production, the employees have that. They may know your customers as well as you do. But they don't know how you do marketing. They don't know your target market. They don't know how you get customers in the door. They know them very well once they're introduced. They don't know that most of the advertising that they could do is a waste of time, that uh, they're going to get inundated, as you have, and you've learned with calls from radio and television and, and other media that don't reach your target market. You know better. You may have learned the hard way that it, it feels really good to see your name in print. Because you're warm feeling that deep down, but it doesn't do you any good. Same as wetting your pants. So they need the employees need to be brought up to speed on what marketing really is, and that it's not anything about advertising. It's about identifying customers and packaging packaging your goods and services for them, and reaching out with the message that differentiates you from everybody else, offering the same type of solution. And they need to know business systems. They know they get a paycheck, but they don't know how you do it. They don't know how you do health insurance. They don't know how you do sexual harassment training. They, they, uh, they don't know accounting. And they're going to need to know it. And they're going to need to know why they do accounting. And that's to give them information to run the business so that they know when something's going wrong. And, and that's the only flag. I had a a client who started a business of mobile doggy care and she had a truck and she was doing great, a lot of sales. Her accounting system was she'd come home every night, put the money in her underwear drawer. And when she got a bill, she'd pay for it out of her underwear drawer. One day she came to me and said, there's no money left. I said, I can't tell you why. We don't know whether your, your vehicle cost was too high, your sales were too low, your prices were too, we don't know because you didn't do any accounting. And you know that, uh, 
you couldn't be here if you weren't doing some accounting and understand it. So the employees need that. You can turn an employee into an entrepreneur. It may take a week. I, I've done it. These guys will do the accounting part. They'll, they do accounting training. So we can help you increase value with a business plan. You may not think you need a business plan because you're not going for a loan, but you need a plan to specifically address how to get that business value maximized. You, they may be in a better position to recognize your potential strengths than you are. You want to increase profitability. Part of that is to stop stealing from your own business, stop putting in expenses that aren't really necessary. Uh, be proud of paying taxes for three years and what it's going to do for you when you, when you go to sell this place. Approach your overhead as, as justifying every dollar you're spending. A lot of times you'll spend the same amount on something year after year. Why? Uh, can you eliminate it without impairing the business or is it just something you do? Uh, you can improve connections, but all you're doing is trading accounts receivable for cash. Looks better, but it really isn't. It's not, it's not going to improve the bottom line, but it's going to improve the appearance of the business. And stop taking on new contractual expenses. Uh, don't make a capital improvement unless it's really something that has an immediate return. Your buyer is going to make these decisions for himself. If you, pre, if you prejudge or, or second guess that, you may not go the right way. Don't redecorate the office. He might not like the colors. You know, clean it. But, you know, don't. I had a house for sale and I said, should I put in a new kitchen? And the kitchen people who could have made money off of me said, you don't know what the buyer wants. He said, half the time I go in and I got a brand new kitchen when somebody buys a house. So think about that. Uh, Contractual experience, things like leases are okay. Um, most, most times a lease, if you can get the landlord to give you a lease with options, that's very tenant favorable. That gives the buyer some flexibility. But if you sign a 20 year lease, you know, they're, they're trapped in that space and, that, and they might preclude one of your competitors from buying your business for a a great amount of money because one of the economies of scale they can achieve is consolidating to less locations. So think about it from what a buyer might want and it's hard to second guess them, but be aware that changes, be aware when changes may not go along with what you can expect. All right, now we're gonna get into the work of preparing the business. You have a lot between your ears that contributes to the success of this business. So you establish and document policy and procedure. How do you do that? How do you make the chicken pot pie? How do you, how do you engage social marketing, social media to market your business? You know you do it. This is, this is internal documents now. These don't go to the buyer. The buyer should be made aware you have it documented. That means a lot to them but you don't want to teach them how to run the business until it's going to be theirs. So every policy and procedure, every recipe, every secret formula, document it. Those are, those are assets of the business that exist between your ears. We've got to get them into a marketable condition. You optimize your workforce. You get rid of the deadwood. People, you know, there are some dear legacy employees that just don't pull their weight. Now's the time to push them into early retirement or into another position and get rid of the brother-in-law that's on the payroll that never shows up to work. Then in documentation, what are your assets? Make a list of all your tangible fixed assets, your intangible assets, real estates, and any overdue write-offs from obsolete inventory or useless equipment, take them now. They're going to come out and do diligence and there'll be a problem. Uh, you're going to need these lists for the closing anyway. Your accountant may have a depreciation mm -hmm. schedule, but I'm sure it isn't detailed enough for this purpose. It probably has a block of production equipment 
a block of furniture and fixtures. Well, itemize these. You don't have to go crazy. You can put in, you know, a lot of chairs. You don't have to stamp each chair. But you're going to need this for the closing documents anyway. Now, if you have contingent liabilities, now's the time to get rid of them. You may have um, lawsuits, claims from suppliers, uh, claims from contractors that are in dispute. The contractor billed you for uh, painting the place, did a terrible job, and you're still fighting them over what now? Now's the time to get rid of these things. And here's the emotion again. That guy did a lousy job and you're going to have to pay him off. You don't have to pay him off full, but you got to, you got to work out these things because they're, the, the buyer's going to look at them in due diligence and say, well, I don't want to take that on. A matter of fact, I think he did a good job. You know, you, you never know. Uh, loss control programs. If you don't have a loss control program, this is a good idea to consider and it's free. Go to your insurance agent and say you want the carrier to send the loss control engineer for your industry to meet you. They love to do this. It saves them claims. Uh, when I was in the restaurant business, I did loss control uh, safety committee, which was just employees that I deputized to enforce the rules in the field and manage care. And my experience mod went from 1.3 to 0.7 in three years. And uh, I had the insurance company ask me if they could send people to me so I could explain how it's done. Uh, so this is a free service. Talk to your insurance agent. And we got to stop the monkey business. You know what I'm talking about. Uh, it's better if it shows on the bottom line than if you say, if you claim you're getting a benefit or if you claim sales that aren't booked, it's much more credible if it's showing on the books. Somebody was once selling me a restaurant and he claimed the sales were half a million greater than he was, sh he was showing on the books. And I said, well, what's this? He said, well, I do banquets under the table. Okay, well, your food cost, your, your food purchase don't support that business. Well, I buy food under the table. I said, your labor doesn't support it. He said, well, I pay people under the table. I said, you're wearing your tables out from the bottom. I can't touch it. I can't, you know, how can I verify half a million dollars that you're claiming that Cutting staff so that the customer is no longer receiving service, raising prices so the customer is no longer getting value, reducing employee benefits suddenly, which will cause an exodus over time. He can sell to uncreditworthy customers that have been trying to do business, but he knows he's never going to get paid. He can sell down inventory, not, not replace his inventory, and sales go up, costs stay low. Um, and I've seen, I actually saw somebody selling a dog food retail. She was break even and she had nothing to sell. So she maxed out her credit cards and put the money in the business's sales. It's, it's done, but it, it shows up. Most, most, most thieves aren't sophisticated enough to, to thwart the audit trail. I mean, I went down the balance sheet. I saw what was going on. I said, ah, where'd this money come from? It didn't come from the business. Um, we have industry standards. They're published industry standards. If your numbers, if your percentage of rent or cost of goods is going gonna, is gonna to be vastly different from that, you better have a good reason because we, we'll get into due diligence. It's going to come out and it's going to ruin their deal. So then you pr pr produce a sell sheet, a promotional package, one sheet of information you're gonna give to people who are serious buyers. You're not gonna put this, you're not gonna direct mail this around, the, around town. You may bring it to your trade association. Um, you, may, you may hand it to somebody who has expressed an interest, but this is, this is basic information 
but it's still confidential. Very limited. What is your business? What are your, what, what are your market strengths? What, what, your history is a great story. I'd like to hear every one of them. It, it's just fascinating to me how people struggle and create a business. Uh, and, it, and it legitimizes the business. It makes a buyer think, oh yeah, I see how it's done. Maybe I can do it. Um, what is included in the sale? I talked about the contractor who also owns rental property and he's got it. He's got to make it clear that he is selling the contracting business and the, the building that the contracting business is housed in and nothing else. Because a lot of people have entrepreneurs tend to be serial entrepreneurs and they've got interlinked businesses, cross collateralized. Uh, you know, I, I met a guy who had like five uh, K ones on his tax return from all those businesses, but you want to simplify it. So the buyer, you can say in two sentences what your what your business is, what, what it's selling, what you're selling. Summary financials, no details. Remember the details are dangerous. Somebody figures out your business strategy from your cost profiles, that's not good. They can become a competitor or they can sell it to competitors. Sales and net. If you want to put in SDE and you can and you know what it, that is, or they've helped you arrive at it, you can, you can Confidently put it in, great. All right. And aggregate cost. Here's my cost of goods, here's my overhead. You figure out where it came from. You can't. And, that, and <clears throat> buyers sometimes will go to them and say, This is all he gave me. Yeah, that's all you get. Here's what it really means. Here's here's what those figures mean to you at this point in the process. Uh, in addition to the, you made a list of assets for this purpose in here, you can just put aggregate numbers by category, so much production equipment, so much land, so much, uh, inventory, but you want to mention any intellectual property that adds value or contributes is deployed in the business and contributes to that bottom line, because those are unique market strengths that your business has. Uh, your leases are worth money. Your lease may be, it may be under market or it may, at the very least, it's going to give the business stability. You, you've got five more years in this location with, to get that return guaranteed with this lease. If you have contracts with customers, you can describe them but not reveal them. Um, by the way, on intellectual property, trade secrets are better than patents because they last forever. Uh, and you just have to keep it as a secret, need to know only, and make everybody who gets it acknowledge that they know a trade secret. You may have a secret process that you don't know you have. Think about it. Is there something you do that's your own particular, that comes out of your own particular way, method, formula? Um, and copyrights. The very first slide I called, I had a circle C copyright. That didn't cost me anything. This is not registered. That's called a common law copyright. If you want to protect your brand, every time you put your brand in print, on your letterhead, on your brochure, in a contract, put the circle C. You're, you're claiming that that's your copyrighted material. And it's not as good as registering with the US Copyright Office, but I, I don't even think most things other than a, 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 a song or a painting would be worth copywriting. If you want a trademark, put a TM after your trademark. If you want to register, it's about 300 bucks and you can do it yourself. Um, the US Patent and Trademark Office is really small business user friendly. If a big guy comes down on you and say, you're infringing on my tra trademark, and this has happened, we've, we've fought back filing for prior use and ended up with the big guy paying my small client a royalty. So think about what you might want to protect for your brand. Your brand has value. And these guys can help you look at your brand and, and think about ways that you can protect it. it, it 
may not add value to the buyer, but it certainly attracts the buyer. And finally, on your promotional package, everybody wants to know how much. Nobody ever comes back to a dealership unless they know what the car is going to cost them. So you're going to have to put a price in. You put one at the high end of the range. It's still reasonable, uh, but um, usually a buyer is not going to proceed to the next step without knowing what is on the line. Now, a friend of mine in mergers and acquisitions says, told me, well, people sell their business two years after they should have. So what? There's no such thing as market timing. You decide when you want to sell it and you do the best you can at that time. Any stockbroker says, I've always sold at the peak of the market. Is he lying or damned lucky? And, I, and it's not going to last because nobody, nobody can predict the future. So market timing is a myth. Decide when you want to sell. Do the best you can with what you've got. And you look for value if you're, if you're not going to sell for a little while. And ideally, you're going to make the commitment soon and, and process and, and prepare over a couple of three years. Uh, you can look for ways to increase that SDE that's going to determine your price. And get that outside impression of your business. What can you do that there's, there's always low-hanging fruit? You know, there's always the pile of manure you can move out of sight. So uh, somebody outside with an outside viewpoint will be very helpful in pointing that out. You buyers, do you really want this life? And you sellers, offer them a taste. You want to come behind the counter and, and shadow me for a day? I'll show you, I'll show you how it's done. You, you, if they get engaged, they're much more likely to go to the next step. Can the buyers live with the risk? You know, the, in a lot of cases, being an entrepreneur is having a job that's hard to quit. Um, are they realistic about, do they understand what the strength of your business is? Or are they, are they going to go in there and make wholesale changes that will ruin the market you create is taking a long time to build. Do they understand how hard it is to exit a small business? Let me tell you, I had, for my medical center, I had an offer long before, I, that was gonna be my retirement income, it was a cash cow. I, I put $100,000 into to repairs until I couldn't figure out anything else to spend it on. And uh, somebody said, I want to buy it. It was my major tenant. And I said, well, I teach that you don't get many good opportunities for exit strategy. And if you get one, think about taking it. And I said, well, I got to put my, uh, my money where my mouth is. And so uh, there aren't many great exit strategies. You're, you're here to, I'm here to teach you to determine them. Uh, and your buyer has to understand the same thing. They're getting into something for the long haul. And you can help them understand your market. Once, once you get to know them, once you've got a deal on the table, it's going to make it more attractive and it's a good negotiating point. I tell buyers, don't get focused. Remember the bridge over the river cry. You don't have to do this. Uh, but it may be a great idea. Um, Send the buyer to these guys to interpret your financial statements. They probably have never seen one quite like yours. Um, send them to these guys for a business plan. It's going to make them feel a lot better about what they're doing. And that business plan becomes a feasibility study. If it works, it, it points to whether they should buy it or try to open their own. Which is, let's face it, it's a lot harder to start a business than to buy one. I have to be honest with you, I've never started a business. I've always bought them. It's so much easier because what I bought, whatever I bought, I knew what my costs were. So here's negotiating. Everything you need to know, to know about negotiation, you knew when you were nine. 
It's so simple. Here's how it works. You, you open your lunchbox, you're sitting next to Sally, and you have a bologna sandwich, and you hear Sally go, hmm. And she opens her lunchbox, and she's got a tuna sandwich. And you go, hmm, you want to trade? That's it. That's all there is to it. You have to give to get. It, it has to work. It, that's called win-win. So how do you do that when you're older and you're not dealing with a sandwich? You're dealing with something that's worth a lot more. Well, you, you got to know the other side. What are their goals? And a buyer would be smart to say, why are you selling? You would be smart to say, why are you buying? And get an, start to get an idea of what, what they're thinking of. You may be looking for an exit strategy. You may have a plan. You, you have family income needs. And a smart buyer may say, look, uh, how about I rent the property for 10 years and you'll have income and you'll pay less taxes. He gets financing. He doesn't have to come up with all that money up front. You get that income you're surely going to miss. He wants to get a good value. He wants to be sure he can make a living. And you can, you can show him that he can, he can pay you and make a living. Uh, he may want entrepreneurship, God help him, but he's going to get it. What else do they want? Uh, I've seen all kinds of structured deals with annuities uh, that spread the, uh, the income over time and the expense for the buyer over time. Uh, installment sales that lower the taxes because the tax bracket is lower each year. Now, it's just simply understanding their position. Uh, you have to care. To give to get, you have to care. And uh, if you think you can clobber somebody out of strength, I advise you not to. I've never seen it work long term. If you get mad, go tell her. Don't tell. You can kill a deal with, with harsh words. Don't forget both of you have to have a degree of trust to do this. And if it breaks down because of one foul tweet, that's a, that's a tragedy. Now, the next step in the process, buyer issues a conditional offer letter. There are many conditions that should be in the, in the, the initial offer because all they have is that sell sheet and what you've, what you've told them since. Mm -hmm. So they, it may be based on, I'm, I'm going to give you this for your business, which includes this, this, and this, provided that the equipment is serviceable, the inventory is merchantable, there are no liens or lawsuits, uh, that you have the legal right to make the transaction, you would be surprised. You may have that contractual obligation to the bank. You may have a partner with a buy-sell agreement. You may have a lease that precludes um, transfer. And the buyer should not assume that you can sell it just because you gave him a sell sheet. Remember I said clean this up beforehand? The buyer may say there's no more than this in accounts payable, or at least that in accounts receivable, because you told him that, he's going to put it in writing now. Uh, he's going to validate all, put all your other claims that you've made into the offer letter. Verification of all this. May be subject to financing, and that's a tough one. Uh, buyer may say, subject to the buyer securing a quarter million dollars financing at no more than 6% for a term of at least 15 years. You're not a banker, but here's a couple right here that'll, that'll tell you what that means. They may not tell you whether that buyer can do it, but there are credit bureaus that will give you a credit report on the buyer, the same one the banker gets for about 75 bucks. You can pre-qualify your buyer and, you know, get rid of the, the phonies before they, before you put too much into this. And you should put a limit on the time. Uh, make sure that he, when he says at an interest rate, no more than that, it's reasonable. And right now that would be 6% or 7% depending on whether this guy's got experience or not. And our banker friends will tell you that, uh, what, what they can expect. And um, that they only have 
so many days to do it. And you cooperate with them, you give them what the bank's going to need, the three years financial statements and taxes, and they've got 30 days to put it together. Your, your, your business is off the market during this period. You don't want to waste time. Subject to due diligence, the buyer shall have 30 days, 10 days, whatever it is, depending on the industry, to examine all assets of the business, all records. Uh, what's the scope of due diligence? Let's, let's, we're going to talk about that in a minute. So you have an offer that's conditional on these things. Don't, don't appear to accept it until you go forward with ne negotiating it. What is for sale? There's two ways to sell your business. If it's a sole proprietorship or partnership, it's gonna be an asset sale. You're gonna sell the assets of the business to the buyer. You can't sell a sole proprietorship because it is you. A partnership to change interest has to be dissolved and reformed as a new partnership, which is really, really easy, but you can't sell a partnership. You can only sell its assets. If it is a corporation or LLC or one of the variations of those, you can either sell the entity, the whole corporation or LLC, or the corporation or LLC can sell the assets. So in an entity sale, the buyer is going to purchase the whole entity. It closes one day and opens the next. Nothing changes. The accounts payable goes with it. The liabilities go with it. The receivables go with it. The everything, it just new owners and even contingent liabilities. This is why buyers would prefer not to buy the entity. There may be a lawyer out there somewhere ready to send a writ in. And sometimes in a, in a purchase and sale agreement, there'd be a guarantee that if there are any outstanding writs or, or liabilities, that, that they'd be the seller's responsibility. Um, an entity sale can be, a, you don't need to know this, but you need to be aware that it might affect you. If you, if you sell an entity, if you sell the assets from an entity that is an accrual-based taxpayer, and most corporations are accrual-based taxpayers because they have inventory, you have to be. Um, the accounting rules say that the sale has to be recognized in the year it is consummated regardless of when you receive payment. So you're gonna pay all that tax the first year and you may not get paid uh, for a while if it's an installment sale need to be aware of that. You may, I ran into a situation where the buyer had to buy the corporation because uh, it was a accrual based taxpayer. All individuals are cash basis taxpayers, so it, it's different rule. If he, if he buys the business and pays me over 10 years, I declare the income as I receive it, not the year that the deal goes through. Don't let it hurt your head. Ask your accountant about it. Um, so the seller would like to sell the entity. Be done with it. You take it over. Uh, the, the liabilities go with it. The buyer may be, um, may not be so inclined to buy the entity. In an entity sale, Everything over your basis, your personal basis, not the business basis, not what's on the books of the business. Those go with the business. The depreciation just goes on the way it was. What you, your investment in the business, less what you took out is your basis. You may have a negative basis. That's a capital gain, 100% capital gain, no regular income. The seller, the, the, the seller's basis is your, the, Investment retained earnings. There may not be any retained earnings. You may have taken everything out. Uh, the buyer's uh, basis is now what he paid for the business. The personal basis increases. You need to know there's a two different ways to do it, but when it comes down to it, you need your account to explain the difference or these guys because this will hurt your head if you get dwell on it too much. So the buyer may want to 
by the assets as opposed to the entity. In that case, the seller would, would transfer the assets to the buyer, would dissolve the corporation or LLC and find, file a final tax return. If you sell the entity, you're probably gonna be required to file a short year tax return, pay the taxes up to that closing. And if you sell the assets, the buyer would form a new business around it. it doesn't have to be an LLC, it could be a sole proprietorship. <coughs> now there's another trap here called the bulk sale. If you sell all the assets of your business in one transaction, a lot of statutes in every state say that's a bulk sale, you really sold the entity and, and the tax treatment is different. It's, a, it's, a, it, it's because it has been used as a vehicle to, to avoid debt. The debt doesn't go, the debt stays with the corporation, the corporation dissolves. Sometimes people, debtors get the short end of the stick on this. You can avoid the uh, bulk sale with the lawyer who knows purchase and sale by putting certain things in the contract and it will, it will carry as an asset sale. Now in an asset sale, the, the contract, the offer should state what he thinks he's buying, never offer to buy the business, offer to buy the business, including what you think you're gonna get We'll sort this out later. The seller retains the debts. He's required to discharge any existing debts. He winds down the business, files a tax return, and the buyer creates a new business. Here's the thing that a lot of people skip. It requires a purchase price allocation. You have different classes of assets. Land, if there's land included, land can't be depreciated. The value of the land that the buyer get, the seller gets above his basis, his cost, is a capital gain. But the seller can't depreciate the land, so the seller doesn't want uh, a high allocation of land because he can't get any expenses out of it. Buildings have a long life. Once again, the excess over the uh, book value is a capital gain unless there's accelerated depreciation, then it's a recapture of depreciation at regular income rates. Usually people don't use accelerated depreciation on buildings, they use it on equipment. Ask your accountant. Here's a trick that you, you could tell the, the buyer, it won't affect you at all, but it will really be a help. You can allocate the purchase price of a building to its components. There are engineers who specialize in this. Within the building, there's carpeting, there's uh, finishes, there's a parking lot, there's landscaping. Those can be carved out into separate items on the, on the balance sheet and depreciated much quicker. So he can get around that long depreciation on the building and get some tax savings. And if you tell him about that technique, uh, that's good negotiation. You're giving. It has to be done shortly after the purchase. Uh, if you do it, if he does, if he starts taking depreciation on the building and then does it, uh, the, the IRS can, can deny that it can say that you've already set your depreciation schedule. Equipment is depreciated over a shorter period of time. The value over your book value that you get for it is a recapture of depreciation to the, up to the point of what you paid and after that it's a capital gain. You ask your accountant, but you need to know that you, in an asset sale you have to allocate assets. I had somebody buy a simple uh, health food store and when we set up her accounting system I said, well what did you pay for the equipment? She said, I paid 35,000 for the store. I said, no, no, how much is equipment, how much is goodwill? She didn't know, she asked her lawyer, he didn't know. He asked the seller's lawyer, he didn't know. It would never been discussed. So now we're negotiating an allocation after the sale, the check's cleared. It wasn't good position. Goodwill is a, is a real bone of contention. The seller wants goodwill maximized because it's all capital, capital gain, long-term capital gain. 
but it's depreciated over 15 years. So the buyer would like to see something like equipment valued higher that he can depreciate faster. Inventory is, you transfer that at probably below cost because there's some value that's not there, some unsaleable. Uh, it's ordinary income to the seller. You paid ordinary, you paid or, you deducted the ordinary income, the ordinary expense, now it's ordinary income, and the buyer expenses it as it's sold. Now there are two wild cards in here, transition services. You can take an allocation for transition services. You may, in some industries, you may, be, you may offer to stay for a while. Uh, for example, in a, in a physician's practice, he maximizes the value by staying for a whole year to transition every patient to the new doctor. Otherwise, they feel ambushed when they come in and their old doctor isn't there and they don't want to get naked in front of a new guy. So that's what, that, ha that can have a value. The doctor can have a, get a salary or a stipend, and that income is going to flow over to another tax year. Uh, in any business, you can sell transition services. You may not want to. You may, want, you may say, I'll, I'll stay in the store for 30 days. You can call me for a year after that if you want to know how to light the water heater. But it still can have value. It still, still can have an allocation of the purchase price, and it'll be treated as regular income when you receive it. So get paid the next year when you're in a lower tax bracket because you're unemployed. A non-compete is usually vitally important especially in a service business. I've done hair salons, and without a non-compete, the seller can literally take her customers home. Okay, so a non-compete has to be reasonable. You can't say you can never cut hair again ever anywhere. You have to say three to five years, depending on the industry, and in, my, in the service area I've established. So they can't steal, it, steal the customers, they just sold you. Now, due diligence is, a re is for a reasonable time, depending on the industry, how much do they have to dig? Do they really need more than 10 days? If, if the transaction is big, yeah, maybe, because they may have to con contact suppliers and customers. Uh, they get full access to everything, all the physical plant and records. Now. At this point, you still don't have the check, so do you let, let them have the customer list? Probably not. But you can tell them, you can number the customers and, and, to, and show what sales by customer to show them you have a good mix of customers. Uh, same with employees. You may not want to give them a list of employees yet. You may not want to get, look, give them access to the employees. But you have to think about from the moment you decide to sell your business when your employees are going to know about this. They're gonna find out and you don't want them to feel ambushed. Uh, so the, the scope of due diligence is something you should think about soon. If you restrict access in your seller, you're raising a red flag. If you refuse to sign a non-disclosure agreement and you're a buyer, you're raising a red flag. Those are both reasonable things to expect. Full access and a non-disclosure agreement. She can give you a copy of a boilerplate non-disclosure agreement, but you need a lawyer to get you to review it. And it basically says they can't use any information they gather for their own benefit or disclose it to a third party. So you're not gonna create a horrible competitor by opening your doors to these, this person. After due diligence, the buyer can't say, I don't know, I didn't know. Uh, he can't accuse you of fraud because you let him see everything. It's up to him to figure it out. You don't have to point to something and say, yeah, I, I did this. I, you know, this is where I used to keep the dead bodies. But you know, they, it's up to them to, to perform the due diligence. When do you let them have access to the employees? This is very touchy. I've seen deals go really sour. Um, a doctor bought a practice. 
and the, the selling doctor didn't tell his employees till the morning after the closing of 12 people, one state, because they felt ambushed. They felt disrespected. People don't like change. Humans are very adaptable. We can live in the North Pole, hot climates. We can survive as hostages, as prisoners of war. We don't like change, go figure. So you have to ease people into change. And I'll tell you how to do that in a minute. You have key personnel and you have rank and file. Uh, key personnel need to be on board sometime or you're not gonna be able to transfer a great deal of the value of the business. You don't have to protect the privacy of employees when you have an NDA, but you may not give, wanna give names. You may wanna give them a, the buyer a list by title and salary and see where it goes. Um, this is gonna be constantly negotiated during due diligence. When do I get to talk to the employees? You know I need the employees. When are you gonna tell the employees? Um, and if your strategy is continuity, you need those employees. Don't worry about this. Um, Ask your accountant, the tax consequences will be apparent to your accountant when the deal is on the table. You may be asked to take back paper. The buyer may not have enough cash or enough bankability to finance the whole purchase. And you have to ask yourself if the buyer is capable. This is like reverse due diligence. Now he has to show you if he's credit worthy. Um, equity financing, uh, like I said, only so many deals are bankable uh, with, with debt or leverage. Sometimes uh, the only way to do a deal is equity, a partner's money or the, the buyer's money. And there are non-traditional lenders who make loans that are unbankable for economic development, usually will not fa finance a business purchase and sale. This is a special case. This is amazing. They have access to capital to help make your deal. That never happens because economic development doesn't happen with a, with a simple transition of ownership. There's no more jobs. There's no more uh, business. It's not like finance the creation of business. They are making an exception for you guys. So keep that in mind. It, seller financing, if you're asked to do it, remember you're still got a stake in that business that you want to get to divest. There's many flavors of seller financing. Uh, lease to own is the best. You still have the real estate. Are we running out of time? Okay. Um, the purchase and sale agreement is the final agree uh, agreement that makes it legal, that does the transfer. It's fully described in your handout. I seem to have talked more than I did yesterday, or she's watching the clock better. Um, they all have these commonalities. When's the closing? Uh, it, those schedules that you prepared, they're gonna be part of this deal. Uh, the payment allocation is gonna be part of it. You have to warranty that you have the legal right to make this transaction. Uh, all the other things that we discussed. The buyer has to warn that he ha or she ha has the legal right to make that transaction. And the transition services and the non-compete go in the purchase and sale agreement. Leases, side agreements do not. Contracts with customers do not because if you include them and, and there's a problem with one, they all collapse. So keep the purchase and sale agreement only to things specific to the transaction. Um, this is a, just a technique, it's in your handout about purchase price adjustment. So I'm gonna end real soon because everything else is in the handout. But getting back to access to employees, uh, you're talking about change and in order to affect change, you need to disclose enough to get the people to understand. 
Why is it changing? What is going to change? Who is going to bring about the change and when? And the why is, 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 is key. And you, you can get, you can be a change agent. That is to get people to buy into the change by disclosing those four things properly. Uh, and it depends on your situation. One-on-one -on -one meeting with the key people, a group meeting with the personnel. Don't send them a, a, a tweet, a, uh, a tweet, because um, you'd be a twit. You, you need to, This is a this is a personal, a personal thing to transition them. So I will end with this and let you 